Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon to the Global Forum for Food and Agriculture and to Expert Panel 1, Global Perspective on Sustainable Soil Management Toward Food Security, organized by the International Union of Soil Sciences. Uh, this is Eduardo Cosentini speaking, who is uh, the president-elect of the International Union of Soil Sciences. I am a senior researcher at the National Research Council of Italy in uh, Florence. And I'm going to introduce this, uh, I hope, uh, interesting uh, panel uh, organized by the IUSS. The IUSS, uh, the global organization that puts together the soil science societies of 80 countries and has about 50,000 members, all people who are very passionate about the knowledge of soil and the preservation of its health. Since we do believe that it is a soil health that grants life on earth and at the same time grants the achievement of all the sustainable development goals set by the United Nations. This afternoon, four <coughs> prominent soil scientists will present global perspective on sustainable soil management towards food security with different geographic and thematic perspectives. Uh, the first uh, panelist is uh, Dr. Lilian Oigarden, uh, who is a researcher in the Department of Soil and End Use at the Norwegian Institute of Bioeconomy Research. She is chair of the Commission Soil and Water Conservation in the IUSS. She is going to present the soil and water conservation under northern climatic condition and sustainable land management to secure high yields and improve soil protection. Please, uh, Lilian. I hand over to you. Thank you. I'll try to share my screen here. Can you, is it okay, the technique? Okay. Uh, sustainable land management uh, are important to secure high yields and improve soil protection in, in all countries. And in this speech, uh, I will uh, present some challenges for the for the northern climatic uh, conditions. In the northern climate, we have seasonal variations with the winter period, uh, and that uh, limits us to a short growing season, which limits also the number of harvests we can do and the crops we can grow. Uh, and uh, sometimes people say in Norway, you are a grassland because it's so limited what you actually can grow. And in addition to the short growing season, we also have very wet conditions who give the farmers many challenges with the management uh, practices uh, for sowing and harvesting, uh, and also water and the runoff, and th therefore the environmental effects. So this is in a way the usual challenges for agriculture in North. But in addition, we have specific challenges now with the, with the pressure on urbanization to convert agricultural soils to other purposes. And also climate change giving high, high um, um, challenges for production possibilities and the need for more detailed adaptation. And here comes also this soil and water conservation in to try to reduce the runoff and the environmental impact following this runoff. And on top of all this, agriculture should also produce uh, with less uh, greenhouse gas emissions and also uh, contribute to increase more carbon storage in, in the soil. So agricultural areas, they really need uh, protection to be able to, to, do, to, food, to be able to produce food. But we know that the that there are high pressure to convert agricultural areas to other purposes in society. And there are very differences between countries of how much area that are available for, for agriculture. And in Norway, we have just about three, three and a half percent of the total area are our agriculture area. While in Sweden and Finland, they have seven and a half percent and compared to Denmark, they have 66 percent. So therefore, we, we really need to protect our soils. And in the 90s, about 1,100 hectares was converted from agriculture area to other purposes each year. 
And that's, that's the blue columns. And in addition, there was a high conversion also of, er of area that was possible to cultivate. And in 2015, we therefore got the first national soil protection strategy uh, with the goal to limit this conversion from 1100 hectare down to 400 hectare per year. And the last two years, this, uh, this goal was nearly reached for this agriculture, this cultivated areas, while, uh, while much of the area that was not uh, cultivated yet was taken out to, to other purposes. And uh, uh, last year, uh, the government made a new goal to, to re reduce this conversion to below 300 hectares within 2025. And this is also followed by regulations and better guidelines to help uh, the planning process, both regional and in municipalities. And also this uh, soil um, protection strategy has now been widened out to include more about soil health, so, uh, sustainability, and also ecosystem services. So there, there is a lot of, of new and more um, focus on soil protection now than just a few years ago. This uh, example shows uh, agricultural area converted to transport and, and motorways. And very often it's the soil with the best quality and near, near cities that are taken to other purposes. So we really need a better knowledge about soil quality and land use so that the, the planners and others can be able to, to evaluate and find alternative locations for, for highways and urban buildings. So it's really need to have a better knowledge about where the high quality soil are uh, located. But sometimes it's not possible to, to save the soil. And therefore, there has been uh, more, uh, more interest and more investigations now to compensate the co converted area. Uh, and uh, one of the things uh, that is investigated is uh, if, um, if this soil can be removed and improve soil quality on another area. And that could be removal of the topsoil layer, but it could also be removal of whole soil profiles. Uh, and of course, uh, if you remove a whole soil profile, that could be very costly. And I give one example here from a calculation from, from a highway where the removal costs are, are stipulated to 350,000 euro per hectare, while new cultivation uh, would be below 15,000, 20,000 euro per hectare. And if one decides to, to remove a whole soil profile, there are a large challenges with how to actually do this in practice to improve and restore the soil functions and construct a new soil profile where you layer by layer need to do this removal and get a proper depth and also a good soil structure. And there are all these challenges with soil compaction and trafficking and to secure that you after removal got a good soil structure to be the water transport and also uh, optimized for crop uh, production. So many challenges, but these things are actually being investigated and also implemented more and more. Then to the existing uh, uh, area, we also have a lot of, uh, of challenges and um, many of them are related to changes in climate and for us also changing in, in winter condition. And uh, uh, it's... Um, uh, by the end of the century, the growing season might be one to three months uh, longer. And that could give possibilities for more harvest a year for new crops or also extend the cultivation area for some crops. But um, uh, as you know, the day length do not change <laughs> while you come further north. So warmer autumns can mean that uh, may, may some of these uh, grasslands and crops uh, they are not so prepared for, for the winter period and then and for, and for the winter survival. So be able to util, utilize a longer growing season, we also need a crop breeding and adapted plant material. Uh, and also this um, unstable winters with freezing and thawing and freezing and thawing can also be very unfavorable. But uh, so these uh, positive possibilities are often uh, uh, a bit challenged because these negative effects might be even higher. So therefore it's really needed a lot of adaptation. 
And this uh, even wetter climate can give us challenges both with the drainage of the farmer's field so they are, are able to cultivate and also this um, practical management with sowing in spring and harvesting during autumn uh, and soil tillage. And not at least the environmental effect by more water, more runoff and, uh, and the losses of uh, nutrients and uh, particles that follow these uh, uh, particles. If we could get uh, higher yields per area, we could also save, uh, save area from new cultivation. And reports in Norway have, um, have investigated that it could be possible to increase the yields by 20% both for cereal and for forage uh, production, uh, just by improving the agronomic methods. And reports of the yield gap who has been done the latest years show a higher yield gap on the Nordic conditions, maybe 40, 45% potential yield gap. And they point to that better soil management and more focus on soil quality could really reduce this yield gap and increase production. And there, these uh, photos are trying to illustrate some of these things. That's about how we handle the soil. It's about machinery and uh, not driving on wet soil. So a lot of things to, to, um, to with soil compaction, uh, better drainage, uh, too little crop rotation is a point, better, better liming and also to increase the soil uh, organic uh, carbon in soil so that you get a better soil structure and, and by this can give better, better conditions for, for plant growth. So, so for reducing yield gap, uh, this um, focus on soil management are very important. And uh, more to this... Uh, uh, challenges by wetter climate and changed winter conditions that could give us uh, um, more of a runoff. Uh, and that relates to that we need to adapt to extreme uh, events to, pre to uh, protect our soils from flooding, but also that we need to control actually the water transport in the landscape and, uh, and the nutrients and particles who actually follow their runoff. And uh, number one is to control where the water is flowing in the landscape. And these uh, photos, they show uh, some elements of this with the controlling um, where water can, can be controlled to inlets for surface water, drainage, uh, grass covered waterways. So there are many things a farmer actually can do to control where the water is flowing. And the next thing is to control the soil surface so that the water flowing on, on surface uh, take less soil particles uh, within the flow. And that relates to uh, reduced autumn tillage to keep the soil in stubble during winter, um, reduce the compaction and use more of catch crops and the crop cover during these uh, autumn and winter periods. periods and also on very highly erodible soils, uh, use more, more grassland in, in crop rotations. And that leads me to, to the final slide, uh, that uh, we need a really better knowledge uh, about, about soil quality and guidelines and maps that could help uh, planners uh, to really find out where where is this uh, where where do we have different soil quality and that this can help to find alternative locations uh, when they plan for for these uh, buildings and traffic and and all these other purposes. Uh, but but knowledge about soil quality is also needed by farmers to really utilize uh, possibilities for for growing crops. Uh, because crops have different uh, demands for for if it's clay soil and and sandy soils, if it's cereal or if it's vegetables you grow. So it's really needed to, to have a better knowledge about soil quality. But also for environmental planning, we need these uh, thematic maps about uh, erosion risk to plan for, for measures. And also where drainage is needing, where area who are vulnerable for drought and organic matter. And all these uh, uh, better knowledge, um, if we have them on map, can be followed up by, by guidelines who, who give information to how these uh, areas could be, could be treated. Uh, so this was uh, very hurry <laughs> through my 12 minutes presentation. And then I give the floor back to, uh, to Eduardo. 
Thank you very much, Lilian. Uh, it is very nice uh, to see how the climate uh, and land use changes uh, are faced uh, in a northern country. And uh, now we pass uh, to temperate environment. Uh, and uh, our next speaker is uh, Bruce Lascelles, uh, who is Director of Sustainable Land Management at the Multinational Arcadis and President of the British Society of Soil Science, which is uh, going to organize our next uh, World Congress uh, in Glasgow next summer. Uh, he is uh, going uh, to talk uh, about uh, the importance of soils in supporting the creation of greener development. Uh, please, Bruce, uh, the floor is yours. Brilliant. Thank you, Eduardo. And hopefully you can all see um, my presentation now as well. Um, yeah, and so good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's fantastic to be here uh, this afternoon. So I want to use just the next 10 minutes or so to look at the importance of soils in um, enabling and supporting green and developments. And um, this is very much from a, a UK perspective, but I think the, the general principles should resonate wherever you are in the world. And I'll, I'll follow up on definitely on some of the points that, that Lillian has, has raised as well, because they're absolutely pertinent from a, from a UK perspective as well. And really the message is that soils and their health should be at the heart of planning, designing and executing new developments or, or changes to existing urban areas. And this really requires a multidisciplinary approach and, uh, and, and true collaboration as well. Um, as, as soil scientists, we, we can't achieve what we need to on our own. I think we need to recognise that. And um, I was looking back through some of the projects I'd worked on through my career. And, and the image on the slide is a project I worked on um, quite some years ago. And it's a sustainable drainage system or part of a sustainable drainage system on a scheme in Wales that we designed. And at the, that time, it was very novel to not be putting all the drainage into pipes and getting it away from the development as quickly as possible. And getting this design accepted and implemented required just that collaborative approach. And as, as Lillian said, it required knowledge sharing, information, upskilling of, of the people who were working around this. But it worked. The water quality data from the outfalls has shown that. And this, um, this, this part of the scheme um, has been held up as an example of how other schemes should be designed. And getting the soils um, right to support the sort of the, the complex elements within this. So we've got wildflower grass and species of its grassland. We've got the swale where we want better infiltration and, um, and water quality treatment. We've got an attenuation basin. Was absolutely critical to, to the success of this. But if, if I can just um, perhaps start with, um, you know, recognising what the problem is in, in the UK as well. Um, so whilst in the UK, approximately 6% of the land surface is urban, um, over 80% of the population live in these urban centres and they are growing. Unfortunately, land use statistics um, are surprisingly difficult to get hold of. And, and actually, the extent of change is definitely underreported. Um, a really good example is just the simple aspect of the extent of front gardens that have been sealed for domestic car parking. And we don't really know the scale, the true scale of that. But the, but the recent, most recent data does indicate a significant level of change. So in the six years up to 2012, over 22,000 hectares of um, the UK's land surface were changed from farmland, forest and wetlands to urban development. And recent calculations um, have suggested that at this rate, 1% of the UK's land surface will be sealed each decade. And critically, um, it, we, we need to understand where this land is coming from. And around 50% of the land that's used for development is converted from agricultural land. Um, and unfortunately, in the UK, this is not the only pressure on our UK soils and the functions that they uh, are able to deliver. And I've just put a couple of examples up there, statistics from our um, the UK Environment Agency from a couple of years ago. Um, and, and these indicate that around 3.9 million hectares of agricultural land are at risk from compaction. And obviously that has an impact on, on yields, on soil erosion and so on, and the functions of soils. And approximately 17% of arable soils in England and Wales show signs of erosion, but, but potentially up to 40% uh, are thought to be at risk. And I think really kind of um, sadly, um, the, the, the last um, uh, sort of fact on, on the screen there from information available in 2016, that indicated that nearly 60 million tonnes of soil was removed from our urban areas 
And the, the real disappointing thing is that nearly half of that was sent to landfill. So that soil, all its biodiversity, all the functions, all its carbon, put in a hole in the ground and is no longer providing that, that benefit and that wealth to us as a, as, a, as a society. And this is clearly not an acceptable or sustainable situation. The loss and degradation of our soil resources is putting pressure on so many other aspects, food production, flood risk, biodiversity loss, and so on. And clearly, these, these stats, statistics show we're not making the best use of our soils and, importantly, those soil ecosystem services they provide within our development. And um, you know, it's estimated that in the UK that the total cost of soil degradation is about 1.2 billion every year and that's you know you can't even comprehend that that scale of of, of money and, and what you could do with that if our soils were healthy and we weren't having to deal with the issues that come from the fair mismanagement but i i want to want to um sort of um, move on to perhaps the positives here because things are changing and it is perhaps only in the last uh, year two years but definitely i'm seeing a real noticeable shift in the prominence of soils as a topic, the, 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 the desire to understand more about our soils. And I just went back to the, the World Soil Charter and I picked out just a couple of things which, which resonated in this context. The first here, um, point four, notes that decisions being made locally um, must have sort of multi-level and inter interdisciplinary initiatives, bringing in as many stakeholders as possible and also really drawing on sort of local knowledge and then mentioned touched on soil data i'm not going to go into that from a uk perspective but actually we have the same issues here we, we don't have the the wealth and the bank of, of soil data to draw upon really easily and the second point which resonated on this was this um one of these actions required by governments that policy guidance and legislation is needed as well and again i think in a uk context uh, we are and have been lacking in that but as I said, we are starting to see a change and a range of organisations are starting to talk more about soils and really recognising the importance of soils in, in what they're doing and what their, what their, what their membership, what their, um, what their stakeholders are, are doing and wanting. I just pulled out some of these here. So DEFRA, um, Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, one of our government bodies, is looking to refresh one of our, our sort of few pieces of public guidance on sustainable soil use in relation to construction, which is a, a fantastic initiative. Our, our National Soil Science Society, the British Society of Soil Science, um, a driving conversation. And, and really importantly, other specialist organisations are starting to set up working groups and communities of practice to start to bring together, um, for example, ecologists. So SIEM is the um, Chartered Institute of, of Ecology and Environmental Management landscape architects who are our landscape institute to represent so general environmental practitioners and our uh, society for the environment are, are starting to publish um, notes and guidance around soils and construction organizations so syria uh, a really important one in terms of publishing technical guidance are also now looking at soils and, and these organizations want to know what they should be telling their members about soils what guidance they should be um, providing and i think that is fantastic and we will start to see a real sea change as a result of this and what we need to do then is, is start to translate this into how we look at designing and building our developments and i just picked out two two examples so the first is a project that that we've been involved with for for many years it's a, a new housing development on the outskirts of a town called bista not far from oxford um, and we've really tried on this project to drive this multidisciplinary and holistic approach starting with a full understanding of the site, its history, its character and its context to support the design so that we can maximise the benefits in terms of <coughs> biodiversity, in terms of natural capital, in terms of the sort of sense of place and, and importantly health and well-being in terms of our green spaces and how those green spaces are hopefully supported by healthy soils, um, carbon storage and sequestration and, and food security as well, promoting local food production Again, as well, both you know, it has health and well-being benefits, has sustainability benefits, um, and so on. And this has allowed much greater environmental value to be realised, um, where, where the green and the blue spaces start to bring value to those living in this community, and, and ultimately to to the client and the development. They bring a commercial value as well, because there is a, a, a definite um, differential in the in the value of the homes um, in in places like this as well and this approach really needs to become 
the norm. But also, I think we now start to need to shift from from those um, uh, that 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 sense, but also looking at the, the quality and not just the quantity of what's being created. And I think this is where again, soil health and soil function are absolutely critical. And on this um, uh, this wheel here, we've got this is from the project. So carbon is a key driver at the centre, but you could put soil at the centre of a wheel like that um, as well. And and I mentioned quality over, over in, in relation to quantity because many very often many of our developments have a requirement to um, include a certain proportion of land within their boundary that's not developed, and that can be up to fifty percent. And actually, you can achieve that quite easily and probably without a lot of thought. But we need to start driving up the quality of that open space, ensuring that the soils are are healthy and able to provide all the functions that are, are, are driven essentially from the ground up, from the soils and the health of our soils. And the, um, sorry, and the second example is, this is a, um, a much earlier phase of, of, of this project. It's a project in Cornwall, which is in the southwest of, of the UK. Uh, and I, I put the title there, it's another garden village, but starting with soils. And we've been able to undertake a very early review of the soil resources. So we're talking about data and information and knowledge but about their capability to support a range of functions and that may be continuing agricultural production. This development will not be built out, or will be built out over a period of, of probably 30 years. And so actually parts of that landscape will remain in agricultural productivity. So can we start to shift soils around? Can we start to benefit agricultural um, uh, practices by use, using and reusing some of the soils? Um, but also then, you know, their, their capability for local food production, for landscaping, for ecological mitigation. And to kick that off, we, we've developed the soil strategy, which will hopefully really inform future design and construction decisions, really to, to make the best use of the soils, to deliver the right functions in the right places. Uh, and I think we have to be very conscious that we can't have everything everywhere, um, but the right functions in the right places. And importantly, not to see that soil go to waste and not at the end of the build-out period, you're left with a large stockpile of soil, which is a problem. And someone will probably take the easiest route, which is just to dispose of it um, uh, very simply as well. So making, making this the norm, I think, is, is really important, that holistic view, bringing other specialists in to, to support um, and, to, and to drive that, that, that holistic solution. Um, and I'm, I, I, I feel encouraged that the more I hear about what's happening uh, and, and how soils are being talked about and recognised, I think is really important. Um, and, and we've got a fantastic opportunity just to finish off um, to discuss this and other topics later this year when uh, the British Society of Soil Science are hosting, on behalf of the International Union of Soil Sciences, the World Congress of Soil Science in Glasgow. And I hope many of you will be able to join us there for, for the scientific sessions. We've also got tours, and but also importantly, I think, in the context of this, a, a session focused on policy and how we can, or what else we need to do to drive policy recognition, or sorry, drive the recognition of soils and their value within our, our policy and guidance. Uh, thank you, and back to you, Eduardo. Thank you very much, Bruce, for your excellent presentation, uh, which is uh, also highlighting uh, the ecosystem services provided by soil and uh, the question related to the urban development. And these uh, issues is also the topic of the next speaker, uh, Christina Siebe. Uh, who is a senior researcher at the Department of Soil and Environmental Sciences in the Institute of Geology of the National Autonomous University of Mexico. Uh, she's going pre pre to present a talk about the issue of urban soils, as I told you before. And um, uh, this issue uh, is uh, particularly uh, relevant uh, in mega cities like Mexico City. Uh, please, uh, uh, Christina, the floor is uh, yours. Thank you very much, Eduardo, and the organizers for the kind invitation to talk in this forum about the uh, role of soils uh, for the sustainability of very urban and urban areas. As uh, the audience is uh, realizing, this uh, topic has been dealt by all speakers until now, and I will just talk more about this, so it seems to be a really important problem. Um, Population growth imposes important paradigms. It requires larger food supplies uh, to increase agricultural production, more irrigation water and nutrients are needed, 
and this imposes larger pressure on all natural resources. Urban population is rising fast while rural areas are depopulating. Um, the trend uh, uh, currently 54% of the global population lives in cities and the trend is to reach the currently observed urbanization levels in North America and Europe of 75 to 85% by the year 2050. And urbanization implies a large spatial concentration of resources and of uh, uh, waste materials, and it fosters linear consumption patterns. Uh, we take the resources, no matter from which distance, we transport them, uh, requiring a lot of energy, we use them, and then we just dispose them. Urbanization is ongoing rapidly, uh, just some figures here from the book by Lal and Stewart on urban soils. And just to point out, by the year 2030, more than 662 cities will have more than 1 million inhabitants. And uh, by 2025, more than 30 mega cities, it means cities having more than 10 million inhabitants are as expected alone in Asia. So uh, this is a, a remarkable development in a very short time. Urbanization uh, currently affects globally 2.7% of the world's land. One might think, well, this is not too much. Uh, but if you look at this locally, the figures are alarming. Here I show you the Valley of Mexico in these graphs. Uh, uh, where uh, more than 60% of the uh, fertile land and more than 20% of the land uh, in charge of uh, recharging the aquifer have been sealed in the last 70 years. Um, uh, historically, cities uh, develop on uh, fertile lands. They are close to uh, potable water supplies and close to where energy supply is guaranteed. And this means that urban growth jeopardizes vital soil functions, as uh, my four speakers also have pointed out, as the food supply, the groundwater recharge. And here I also want to uh, stress out that land sealing increases flood risks uh, and also affects biodiversity and carbon sequestration, as you have already heard. So cities are closely connected with their surroundings, as shown here in this satellite image, uh, showing the metropolitan area of Mexico City and the Mezquital Valley, where more than 800 square kilometers receive wastewater through an expansive uh, net of drainage canals. Uh, and here we see an exchange of 52 cubic meters per second of wastewater for food and fodder, and in the future also probably of recharged groundwater between the city and the peri-urban area. Peri-urban areas have an enormous potential to contribute to the sustainability of cities when they are adequately planned. They can preserve, uh, prevent urban sprawl, protect valuable agricultural land, and enhance its productivity by uh, recycling organic waste materials. They uh, also have the potential of preserving natural vegetation areas, which then can be used for not only uh, bioconservation, but also for recreation and carbon storage. But the problem is that most uh, peri-urban areas uh, in many places in the world are uh, degra degraded and form shanty towns and misery belts where land degradation occurs and erosion and compaction and pollution is the everyday scenario, uh, which then also affects water and air pollution. And we have waste dispersion by uncontrolled landfills, etc. And all this is further challenged due to climate change. Um, climate change uh, will decrease water availability 
in many regions of the world. Uh, here, um, it will be urgent to optimize water resources, exchanging potable water with treated wastewater for the irrigation, uh, particularly in arid and semi-arid regions. Uh, on the other hand, large frequency of storms will overburden sewers in the cities. And there, there is an urgent need to increase infiltration areas within the cities. And this means a better soil management in the cities. Dry periods and water saving strategies have jeopardized sewers in other regions. So we have to start rethinking more seriously on the reuse and wastewater and to adapt the sewer systems. Um, as I said before, um, urbanization concentrates uh, resources. Among them are all the nutrients contained in food. On the other hand, feeding an increasing population requires larger fertilizer inputs to soil. And the production of mineral nitrogen fertilizer, for instance, requires a lot of energy while uh, phosphate and uh, potassium fertilizers are being exploited at limited geologic phosphate rocks and potassium salt deposits. So uh, organic waste generated in cities could represent alternatives to substitute part of the nutrient demand of crops, but of course they need to be free of pollutants. Heavy metals uh, have been uh, increasing or, or for a long time now uh, concerned uh, uh, these kind of waste materials. And increasingly microplastics are found uh, in these waste materials. And additionally, uh, organic waste materials have uh, the disadvantage of increased larger transport costs and they are more difficult to dose when compared with mineral fertilizers. Um, as I already said, uh, cities also concentrate a lot of urban waste. Uh, on this slide, I just show you a list of all the kinds of urban waste uh, generated in cities. And currently, in most cities in the Southern Hemisphere, uh, the dominant waste management options are to put them just in dumping places, in poorly regulated landfills. Often these waste materials are burned, for instance, in low-tech facilities to produce bricks and then uh, there is a, a severe air pollution involved. Most cities have mixed sewer systems, uh, mixing surface runoff with uh, gray and black water. And in general, we just have to rethink that we are using potable water to transport feces by this worldwide accepted water toilet. I think we really have to start moving on alternatives of this. And there are alternatives for this. In the urban sites, solid waste separation should be mandatory. Uh, start also composting the organic wastes or thinking about using organic waste materials for energy supply and additionally, uh, the residues of this, like uh, the, the transformation by pyrolysis, by hydrothermal combustion and so on, produce biochar, which then can also be used as a soil amendment. We have to think about separating the sewer systems and uh, on thinking on rainwater collection and using this then for the uh, transport of wastewater. In peri-urban areas, we could think about using waste materials for technosoil construction and uh, for um, uh, getting soil amendments uh, out of the organic waste materials like compost and biochar and to irrigate with adequately treated water. So for all these guidelines has, have to be produced, guidelines for the waste management, quality criteria for the different waste materials that then should be used as soil amendments, and guidelines for how much has to be applied to which kind of soil. And here I really want to stress that it's important to regulate the loads 
not only the concentrations of the different elements and pollutants in the soil amendments, and we have to produce guidelines differentiating on how much of these amendments are to be put on different kinds of soil and adapted to the crop type that has uh, uh, will be grown there. So just briefly, I want to exemplarily show you two examples of all what I have said until now. The first one is about the reuse of wastewater for uh, agricultural production in the Mesquital Valley. Here you can see how um, rain-fed agriculture uh, producing two tons per hectare of maize were transformed into uh, wastewater agriculture uh, producing 15 tons per hectare of maize and 100 tons per hectare alfalfa fresh mass. So uh, this example shows that wastewater irrigation has several advantages. Uh, there is the optimization of water use, lower treatment costs, and I want to stress this, uh, if uh, wastewater is being used for agriculture, you don't need to treat it as far as, as uh, if you want to then put the effluent into a surface water body. That's what's happening in the Northern Hemisphere. They have enough water. But in the Southern Hemisphere, we don't have that much water. We need the water for agriculture and it can contain still nutrients. So re let's rethink the water treatment systems so we can really recycle nutrients. And if we do this wastewater reuse, we can increase yields, especially in drylands. And we might also recharge groundwater, increase vegetation cover for erosion control, and avoid the eutrophication of surface water. So all this has to, be, uh, has to deal with sustainable city management. Of course, the reuse of wastewater it has disadvantages. There is a dissemination of potential pathogens and of antimicrobial resistance. And there might be pollution of soil, crop and groundwater by heavy metal and a lot of emerging contaminants. So all of this needs good guidelines. Guidelines regulating the quality of the water according to the need of the specific crop that will be grown with it. And the World Health Organization has done a great effort in publishing these guidelines in 2006. Uh, they are quite explicit in all this. But in parallel, we should also um, um, foster the guidelines of waste management in cities so that these waste materials, in this case, particularly the wastewater, is according to be reused then in agriculture. This thinking has not gone far enough. Uh, the other example I wanted to give is the construction of technosols uh, out of waste materials. Uh, many waste materials can be uh, combined and then rehabilitate formerly sealed plots and you can construct uh, soils uh, in um, former landfills, environmental liabilities, uh, even green roofs can be constructed with these. Again, quality criteria need to be developed and guidelines for technosoil construction. Here I just want to stress the important work that uh, Jean-Louis Morel and his group has done in the University of Nancy in France, but also colleagues in China, in the US and Germany are working strongly in all of this. So just to conclude, urbanization is unavoidable. It gives access of, to people, to healthcare, to education, to better labor opportunities, but the location and size of the cities need to be planned and controlled. We really need to avoid that fertile land is sealed and excessive uh, concentration of resources occurs. So there is an urgent, urgent need to switch from, from linear to circular chains uh, in the use of resources. Sustainable management of cities and peri-urban areas implies, as already said by Bruce, an integrated waste management and a close cooperation between urban planners and agriculture and soil scientists. 
Rethinking of waste management in cities means we separate sewer systems. We start thinking of different kinds of toilets, like dry toilets or vacuum toilets. The wastewater treatment systems need to be uh, adapted to the situations. Domestic waste needs to be separated, construction debris managed. So this is a lot of work and we really need to do this interdisciplinary and interinstitutionally. And first of all, we need outreach campaign, campaigns to sensibilize the public. And that uh, I close. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Christina. Excellent presentation showing uh, soil as a solution and uh, solving the conflict in between uh, urban and uh, rural areas. And now we are going towards a global perspective and uh, Professor Ratan Lal uh, is going to uh, bring us uh, this global uh, perspective. Uh, Ratan Lal is a distinguished university professor and director of the Center for Carbon Management Sequestration, the Ohio State University, and former president of the International Union of Soil Sciences. Uh, please, uh, Ratan, the floor is yours. Ratan, please unmute yourself. You have to unmute yourself, Ratan. Thank, so, thank you, you. Thank you for the opportunity to talk to you. Sorry, I wasted uh, already some time. Uh, the global issues already discussed by excellent speakers before me, soil degradation, one third of all soils, agriculture emission increasing 1% per year, undernutrition 820 million, which was 690 million before the COVID, malnutrition affecting 2 billion people over the world, fossil fuel emission 10 gigaton of carbon per year, water pollution and scarcity aggravating. At the same time, if you look at the carbon stock in the atmosphere pre-agriculture 10,000 years ago, we had a carbon stock in the atmosphere of 360 gigaton, billion tons, petagram. At the time of industrial revolution of 560 gigaton, so until 1750, increase of 200 gigaton obviously came from land use conversion to agriculture and agriculture practices. There was no yet fossil fuel. At the present, 880 gigaton, which means uh, now since 1750 to present, uh, another 320 gigaton both from fossil fuel and land use emission. Uh, total emission from land use and agriculture to date, since the beginning of agriculture, 575 gigaton. Total emission from fossil fuels in 1750, 445 gigaton. Hopefully, the one from the land use part of it can be put back. The erosion uh, and uh, degradation of soil, one third of it, really raises the question of do we have endangered soils? Do we have extinct soils? We talk about endangered plant species, animal species, butterfly, bald eagle, panda. We never hear about extinct soil. We never hear about endangered soil. We indeed have that. The peak soil, uh, ideal conditions, we need about 0.25 hectare of good land per person. Now, I want to indicate that point because uh, in many densely populated countries, uh, many of them in South Asia, 0 0.05 hectare. That creates civil unrest, land grave issues, and refugees, the soil refugees, the climate refugees. Now, here is something to think about. We have 0.25 hectare per person good land, and we have 8 billion people in the world, which we got approximately now, we mean total agricultural land should be about 2 billion hectare. We have 5 billion hectare. Why? Why so much? Looks like we are greedy species. So, yes, there is a peak soil, there is an endangered soil, therefore we have to think about the carbon budget. What happens to the sources, fossil fuel, 
2021, nine and a half gigaton. Land use conversion about one gigaton, total 10. This 10.2 gigaton was absorbed by the atmosphere, half of it, five gigaton per year. Ocean, three gigaton per year. Land absorbing about three gigaton per year. The question is, if the land can be managed properly, and I mentioned two billion hectare under agriculture, if we manage them properly, can feed eight billion people. Why do we need five billion? Why not convert some land back to nature? I would say perhaps as much as two to three billion hectare, at least half the land by 2100 back to nature. We should plan that way. That means plan the human population also that way, hopefully through empowering women, educating them, giving them control on their own destiny themselves. Rather than 11.2 billion, some people think we could probably get by with eight and a half billion by 2100. That will be the way to return the land back to nature. It has been mentioned by many, the way food is produced and consumed affects the health of soil, plants, animal, people, ecosystem, and the planet itself. Diet has something important to do, not only the health of the soil, but also health of the planet. Above all, the Sustainable Development Goal Agenda 2030 of the uh, are reaching all those 17 of them, they are definitely not on track. And I'm sad to say, the Secretary General report on 23rd of September did not mention the word soil. I'm very sad to say, Bruce, the COP26 did not mention the word soil either. I hope this will be rectified. It needs to be rectified. If we don't speak up, that means people think this thing is not very important. One other part which I was very disappointed, Secretary General report said, health of human and animal is interdependent. Sir. Soil health, health of plant, health of animal, health of human, health of environment, health of planetary processes is interdependent and interconnected. One and indivisible. We cannot afford to miss that. This message must come out loud and clear from the soil science community of the world. There's a need for transformative of system that we use. The system we have now, and we heard that loud and clear, from the three speaker before, they are based on five Ds. They deplete, they degrade, they destroy, they discard, they dominate. Take the land away from nature. We must have a transformation by 2100 to something which is based on five R, reduce, reuse, recycle, regenerate, restore. And that transformation requires education, communication, speaking to policy makers, how to translate their words and slogans into action. That's missing, very sadly missing. Soil farming, carbon farming, the strategy to produce more from less. Why 5 billion hectares of land? Why waste 1.2 billion tons of cereal that reach no stomach? animal or human. And then we ask, we need more production. Why? We must produce some more from less land, less water, less fertilizer, less energy, less emission. The goal is to return land back to nature. I'm so sad to hear one fourth of all the landfill in the UK is soil. Wow. Couldn't we think of something better to do with that beautiful resource than take it to landfill? That's the kind of transformation we need. Our food system, they must restore soil and biophysical environment. They must improve social equity and address human dimension. They must adopt prudent governance. They must identify, implement site-specific game change solution. They must strengthen human resource development, education, especially for the women. And therefore create a global science policy interface for sustainable food system production. Regenerative agriculture, many people talk about by different definition. My way of thinking is it's inspired by eco-innovation. 
It's powered by non-carbon energy. It's driven by a circular economy and green infrastructure. It's supported by the recarbonization of the terrestrial biosphere. Remember that 545 gigaton that was emitted since the beginning of agriculture. And that's the bedrock of sustainable development. What you call it, I have no idea. To assume that it's a one practice for 300,000 known soil series is rather being naive, but it must restore, reverse the degradation trend. And that's what we are talking about. Conservation farming, mulch farming, cover cropping. The focus is on C and PK, C before NPK. Therefore, the need for NPK becomes less. The technical potential of carbon sequestration soils of the world, we have estimated, many other people have done, it's about two and a half gigaton of carbon per year. Two and a half. Remember, the total emission is 10. So soil alone cannot address the offsetting of the fossil fuel emission. We must find non-carbon fuel sources. And then if we manage soil and vegetation properly, by 2100, we can put in 178 gigaton back in soil, another 155 in vegetation. They can create a drawdown of atmospheric CO2 of 157 parts per million. But this cannot happen until we incentivize the farmers. By how much? Not $5, not $10, not one euro 35 cents. I do not name the country that pays that. $35 per credit, $120 to $130 per ton of carbon. That means if a farmer squester half a ton, $65 per hectare. 26 per acre. If you squester one third ton, about 40. Undervaluing such a precious resource is the cause of the tragedy of the common. We are suffering from that tragedy. If we want to achieve goal number one of end of poverty, we got smallholder, less than two hectare, 570 million of them. Here is one option. If you want to improve food security of 829 million people hungry, two billion malnourished, here is the option but reward farmer for good thing. This is not a subsidy. This is not a handout. It's not a charity. It is what we are demanding farmers to do. And we must pay them. We have to pay them. Therefore, moving forward in sustainable food system, grow healthy food on healthy soil. Remember the link. The good diet comes from healthy soil. And that is absolutely necessary. We must identify and implement policy to support healthy food system. We must have taxes on unhealthy food. We must have informative food labeling practices, we must fortification and biofortification of food. And of course, we must develop climate resilient food system for which we must pay farmer. Without paying farmer, they cannot do it. I read a lot of news about uh, famine in the world in several parts of them. I'm sorry to mention famines are man-made tragedies. We must make famine and mass starvation politically intolerable, morally toxic, ethically unthinkable, humanly unacceptable through restoration, improvement, protection, management of soil health. At the World uh, Food System Summit, I tried hard. Obviously, I did not succeed. My mantra was healthy soil equal to healthy diet, equal to healthy people, equal to healthy ecosystem, equal to healthy planetary processing. And we must not take rest, soil science community, until this message gets across to those who make the decision on our behalf. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ratan, for your very uh, nice presentation, really lightning. And um, uh, as uh, the time has uh, gone away, uh, I remind everybody that now we have uh, the deep dive and uh, you will be able to join uh, each of uh, the presenter and in this way to pose questions to them. I have seen that there are already some question uh, for uh, the presenters. And so I thank uh, the presenters for very uh, excellent uh, speeches that they gave and, uh, and also thank you all the attendees and uh, I pass over 
to the organization. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Goodbye and hi to the IUSS.